All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Revelation with, with me this morning, please. Chapter 9. Revelation chapter number 9 and verse 1. Let me say this right at the beginning, folks, when I preach anything from the book of Revelation. I believe the book of Revelation belongs in the canon of Scripture. I believe it's inspired of God. I believe it's a matter of the Holy Spirit helping us to interpret what we're reading and make the applications of it. But I believe that what's talking about in the book of Revelation, especially chapter number four on throughout the rest of the book, is yet future, that we're looking into the future. So the book of Revelation opens up the future for us. So if you want to know what's going to happen tomorrow, the next day, next month, next year, the book of Revelation, this is what it's called, the revelation to reveal of St. John the Divine, the Apocalypsis. So in Revelation chapter number 9 and verse 1, the scripture says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared to battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. They had hair as the hair of a woman, and were teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was in hurt. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Watch this, whose name in the Hebrew is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Woe, one woe is past. And behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Bless this holy book, my Father. I pray in Jesus' name now for unction to preach it. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Now what I'm going to preach you this morning may be one of the most important messages that I've ever preached in all the years that I've been preaching the Word of God. I have been introduced to something the past week. I have, had not, I have not had enough time to study it exhaustively. But what I have studied has alarmed me greatly to the point to where I need to get this material out to you that are listening. I originally had planned to preach this tonight, but the Holy Spirit changed my mind and said, preach it in the morning. So this morning I'm going to preach you a message about something that is happening right now yes. while you're sitting in this auditorium. It's in CERN, Switzerland. Now you may not be aware of what's going on over there, but there's a thing over there that's called a Large Hadron Collider. And it is an accelerator. It accelerates particles and then brings them to the point of collision. So this Large Hadron Collider was started up just a few days ago, and it's still in the initial process of being brought online completely. You say, what in the world does something like that have to do with me and the Bible? It has a lot to do with you and the Bible. I cannot and will not attempt to speak as a physicist. It would make me look like a fool. My purpose this morning is to try to be a liaison between them and you is to try to take what's going on in that collider and break it down to where I can understand it and I can give it out so you can understand it to where it makes an application to your life and to this world as we know it today. For what is happening in that collider is an astounding thing. So I want to read something to you this morning from what's called a theoretical physicist. This man, his name is Stephen Hawking. He's well known throughout the world. Anyone that has anything to do with 
with nuclear energy or has anything to do with physics knows this man. And he is one that some rate even on the level of Einstein and uh, of that level. And so I want to read to you what this man has to say about what's happening right now in CERN, Switzerland. Listen carefully. These are the words of Stephen Hawking. <laughs> He recently warned the reactivation in March of CERN's Large Hadron Collider could pose grave dangers to our planet. The ultimate reality, check, we are warned. Hawking has come straight out and said, the God particle, and this is what you've heard referred to time and again as the Higgs boson particle, the God particle found by CERN could destroy the universe. Now let that settle in. This man is an atheist, and he says there is no God. Yet he says that what's happening right now in CERN, Switzerland, and I'll give you what they're trying to do in a moment, what's happening at this very minute in CERN, Switzerland, has the potential to destroy the universe. This is a theoretical physicist. Now, physicists come in all kinds of sizes. Astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson has also sounded the alarm in a hypothetical manner by telling anyone who might want to blow up a planet how to do so. Is this CERN's attempt to do so by attempting to recreate the Big Bang within a man-made structure? This has frightened Stephen Hawking so much. Do they know that they know that they know what they are doing? Ask yourself, how much energy is keeping it together? Neil deGrasse Tyson told co-host Eugene Merman on his Star Talk radio show, then you put more than that amount of energy into the object, it will explode. Now, now I think I've got your attention. I've quoted two physicists. These are scientists. These men do not agree with what's happening in CERN, Switzerland right now. There is a 17 mile long accelerator that lies 300 feet beneath the surface of the ground. This area is where France and Switzerland come together. So part of this accelerator is located in France and part of it in Switzerland. It is a joint European project the United States of America is there as an observer. But the, but the brain power that's going in to this experimentation originates in Europe. They are attempting to recreate what they believe happened that brought all of this into existence as being the Big Bang. Now you and I know from the book of Genesis chapter number one that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. He spoke it into existence. They are finding things, and this is what's important for us to understand today. They are discovering things that they did not expect to discover as they get deeper and deeper into this, uh, into this experimentation and uh, development and research and so forth. They are beginning to find out that there is a whole lot more to the creation than they had ever given thought to before. They're beginning to find out that there's something going on here that boggles the human mind, that literally blows us apart when we try to even comprehend what's happening. This 17 mile long underground tube that is uh, located there in Switzerland has I think four or five different points where they collide with some say protons and maybe something else, but particles that are being moved at or above the speed of light inside this collider. Now for your information, there is one near us in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, but it is not nearly as large as what we're dealing with here. And apparently the larger the collider, the more speed that they can attain and the more they're able to get deeper into what they're looking for. They're looking for the very building blocks of what brought all of this together. To give you an analogy, let's say you have a house. You observe that house, it's beautiful. 
you think, my goodness, let's see how this is put together. And so you start taking the house apart and you expect to find nails, but instead you find glue. That fascinates you that much more because you find glue holding this house together. You wonder to yourself, what was this glue like before its hardened state? Because you see, once the glue glues the things together, it hardens, solidifies. They want to know what the glue was like in its liquid state. So they're going through this to go back to that point to where they can separate and find out what this was like then. And by doing that, of course, they can build on the information and knowledge that they attain. Now what's going to follow in the message this morning is the implications of what's going on. But let me give you just a little bit of what has been happening. Where they have done this experimentation, strange things are happening, unexpected by the scientist. Paranormal phenomena, they like to call it. Apparitions, ghosts, all kinds of demonic spirits are beginning to manifest themselves in ways. Here we have in CERN, Switzerland, a huge wheel. Inside that wheel is a Hindu god, and his name is Shiva. He does a dance of destruction inside that wheel, and his purpose is he is one of the triad gods, one of the greatest gods of Hinduism, Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahma. Brahma is the god of creation. Vishnu is the god of preservation, but Shiva is the god of destruction. The way the Hindu sees it is that when Shiva destroys, it's not for the purpose of annihilation. He destroys so that Brahma can come and recreate. So now when the Hindu sends their scientist to CERN, they put this out there in front. And so what these people are doing with the collider is destroying what comes together, but for the purpose of recreating and find out what brought it into existence to begin with. Are you following me? Yeah. Now here we have men that are scientists on an average of an IQ of anywhere from 160 to 200 or even above. These are some of the smartest brains in all the world. No, that, no question about it whatsoever. I pick up physicists and try to read some of this stuff. I think, good night. Forget me. That's for, a, that's for a brain that is wired that way. No question. But we were told when Darwin's theory of evolution came out and became vogue that it would destroy the foundations of Christianity. And this old book that we hold in our hands, this old outdated Bible, would no longer be relevant. And a lot of people bought into it. Because after all, Darwin is scientific. But it's an amazing thing now that 150 years later, we have some of the greatest scientists in the world that are becoming very religious. Because here they've got Shiva, they've got dances to Shiva, and they are definitely being connected with Shiva as they're finding things. Let me give you one example. In one of their collisions, when they collided these particles together, they saw things. They were apparitions. They didn't expect to see, and they didn't fit in any model. They didn't fit anywhere. They don't belong, but they, they could not deny the reality of it. Something was going on inside there that they could not explain. And it was scary for them. For the scientist has his paper and his pencil and his books, and if it doesn't fit in his paper and his pencil and his books, it's out the window. They don't understand. They have a hard time accepting the fact that there is a spirit world out there. That spirit world was created by a spirit being. An almighty, eternal, absolute being that is from everlasting to everlasting who put in me what I am today by the power of Almighty God and by the power of the new birth. But a scientist like that will never admit that because that takes it out of his control and his power. He's got to be able to, he's got to, be able to demonstrate his theory and put it into motion. But anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to leave this with you. I want you to think about what I'm saying. Stephen Hawking, and a theoretical physicist, has warned these people, you are about to open Pandora's box. 
And once you open Pandora's box, you cannot put Pandora, you cannot put back in what came out of that box. Now let's talk about some of the stuff that's going on. I think I'm trying to lay a foundation for you to get you to understand what we're dealing with. So the house, you take it apart and you see the glue and you find it in its hardened state. And then you want to find out what can I do to bring this back to its original state and then what can I learn from that? So you've got to be able to take it back. You've got to be able to go back. You've got to move through time. That's what you're doing. You're moving through time. This is what it's about. They want to know what that matter was like before it came into its present form. They must determine what holds it together. They must break down the element and see what holds it together. Now, folks, if you know your Bible, you know what's holding it together. This, this, this is a big deal to these people. What's holding this together? The Bible says all things are uphold or withhold, upholded by the word of his power. A word is a spiritual thing. You can never put it under a microscope, but it's real. Who sealed you until the day of redemption? The Holy Ghost. Who put life inside your soul? Where your heart is set on fire when you read his word and pray, the Holy Ghost. Who would in this house to, would deny this morning the reality of a spirit being that saved you and wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life and indwelled you right now? But they want to know. They want to find out. CERN allows them to examine particles in their initial state, not after it's bonded together. So what has come from CERN? Now listen carefully what I'm going to say to you. I'm not going to, this is not exhaustive, but this is what I've gotten so far. What has come out of this? They have a list of their accomplishments, their achievements, and all of that. That's all well and good. But one thing for certain is what's called antimatter. How many's ever heard of antimatter? Antimatter. Now, if you'd asked me two weeks ago what antimatter was, I'd have said, well, it's matter, it's against matter. <laughs> then I have a clue. <laughs> I wouldn't know where to start, where to end, where I was if I got there. Let me tell you what antimatter, some of the characteristics of it. There are those that believe that for everything in the universe that is matter, that there is a corresponding antimatter. Corresponding. That there's a connection between the two. That matter, for example, take a piece of wood. It's matter. This is matter. This is matter. 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 It's something physical or it's something real, all right? If you act upon it, act upon that matter, it can burn wood, for example. You've acted upon it, but you've had to act upon it. You've had to do something to cause the wood to burn. Antimatter, on the other hand, is a very unstable thing that does not need to be acted on. Unless you do something to contain it, it's going to burn. It's very volatile, and it is very, very, very uncertain as to what all it's capable of doing. Antimatter is a product of this experimentation in CERN, Switzerland. Antimatter is coming from it. Antimatter is so powerful that one man says that one grain, one grain of antimatter is the equivalent of four atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima. I got on the internet and did a little research, and I found out, they call it Little Boy, the first bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, then later on the one on Nagasaki. I thought, what was in that bomb? What exploded? You know, we understand nuclear fission and all these other big terms. We understand some kind of a nuclear reaction took place. Everybody knows that, right? Some kind of a nuclear reaction took place. But then I got to digging a little deeper and I said, now, what was in there? And from what I can find out, it was no more than from 9 to 13 grams of something inside their matter that exploded. And so I have to understand their scale. What are you talking about? You're talking about a handful? It doesn't sound like much to me, does it? In other words, the bomb that exploded at Hiroshima when they split the atom, when they released the energy from the atom by the process they used, are you telling me that there was no more there than what would be a handful? 
I'm not saying I understand all that, but I want you to think about it for a minute. If no more than a handful of this material, this matter, that's what you'll get if you look on Wikipedia and some of these research, it'll say matter. It'll say 8 to 13 grams of matter was used to explode and release energy and heat. And I would imagine, I don't know their scale, I don't know. In other words, is their gram the same as a gram of, 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 of peanuts, a grain of uh, peanuts or something, or is it, is it a different scale? I don't know. But it wouldn't seem to me to be a whole lot to begin with. So, if that did that, one grain of antimatter is the equivalent of four of them. How much is one grain of antimatter? They say it takes a long time to produce a single pound of antimatter. But now because of their technology and what they're doing at CERN Switzerland, that they can produce this stuff much quicker. And they're beginning to produce antimatter. When they produce antimatter, strange things happen. They took some of it and they put it in a college. They won't name the college and for reasons I understand. And the college had the facilities to contain it. Antimatter has to be contained. So they put it in a college <coughs> to contain it. Strange things started happening at the college. People started hallucinating, having visions. People were going wild. All kinds of crazy stuff was happening. Apparitions. In plain words, there's a connection between this stuff and the spirit world. Now, I want you to think for a minute. Don't get ahead of me. Just think. The Bible said, He that letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. God Almighty is going to let them go so far, but He's not going to go any further. The spirit world, folks, is not affected by the physical. Demons, all this other stuff, probably couldn't care less whether you've got matter or antimatter. It's a spirit being. But to fit into the great deception. That's coming, and it's coming, and it's about here right now. I mean a deception like this world has never known before. To fit into this great deception, they can sure draw these men in to make them think that because they have reached this certain point in their scientific analysis, that they're bringing in these spirit beings. It'll make true believers out of them, but it'll do more than bring two, make true believers out of them. NASA said just a few days ago, NASA, they said just a few days ago that by the year 2020 that we will definitely come in contact with aliens, beings from another planet. Now we're talking about scientists. We're talking about Darwin's crowd. We're talking about the crowd that threw the Bible out and said it's old, archaic, anachronistic. It doesn't belong today. We're talking about that bunch. We're too smart for the Bible. We're scientists. Yet this crowd is saying that in just a few years that they're going to know, that they know that they're going to come in contact with alien beings. I thought to myself, my, 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 my. Do you boys, have you, already, have you always known that? That you've got a certain date set? And what you think is an alien being is really a demon? There are no aliens out there, folks. Forget that stuff, okay? There's nothing out there. You get into the third heaven, you get into the abode of God. There's nothing up there. All these UFOs, spacecraft, flying saucers, all this stuff, that's all demonic. It's real, but it's demonic. It's not real like we understand reality, but it's really real. <laughs> it's demonic. I see a great deception beginning to develop. 
that in their analysis and in their laboratories that they believe in, that they've got their heart and soul tied up in, little things begin to show up, stuff that they can't explain, that sucks them in to begin to understand, well, maybe this is, a, this is being affected, it's being acted upon by something that we don't understand completely. And this spirit being that comes from out there, that comes down to this world, they accept with open arms because they're willing to put Shiva out there dancing around in the cosmos and destroying and then bringing a new creation in. Here are these wise, smart, brilliant men. And they're willing to believe that there's something more than what can be measured in a microscope and can be put in a petri dish. That there's something going on. And you better believe there is. There's something going on. Now in the spirit world that I just preached to you about, you can see that. Now what about the physical world? Let's go back to Hawking for a minute. He said, remember he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in spirits. He's a dialectical materialist. He's a Bolshevik. He believes that what they're liable to do here in CERN, Switzerland, is unleash the gates of hell on this earth. The reason I took you to Revelation is because in the ninth chapter of Revelation, what you just read, is the gate of hell. Yeah. Revelation chapter number 4 is the door to heaven. When he catches up his saints to meet him in the clouds, we're going through the door into heaven. But he will open the gate of hell on this earth. And according to Revelation chapter number 9, these beings are coming up out of the earth. If you remember when Saul went to the witch of Endor, she said, I saw, oh man, I saw spirit coming up out of the earth, coming up. What she see? She saw demons. Until God brought Samuel back himself personally, the real Samuel, who appeared before Saul and the witch of Endor. How, what would be a greater ruse than to use their science and their technology to suck them in to accepting some spirit being coming from somewhere up here, some alien, down to this earth and do it through a collider over here. This is as high a technology I suppose you got on this earth. And do it through that and bring it down upon this earth and bring it into people. Now here's one of the things about this. This, this, this antimatter is also called dark matter. And dark matter has energy attached to it. And the energy affects people. It affects them. And remember, when you produce antimatter, you've got to contain it. Because if you don't contain it, you've got to contain it. That's the biggest problem, containing it. Because if you don't contain it, it just goes wild. And they don't know what it's liable to do. Now, folks, go check me out. Go check me out. I, I want you to. Go check me out this afternoon and see what it says about antimatter. And it will say, yes, you better contain it because you don't know what it's liable to do. But they do know this. From what they've experienced so far, it has an effect on people. Dark matter has an effect on people. It causes some people to go screaming mad. It controls people. It is an, it is an enormously powerful thing. It's pulling something out of hell that you don't want any part to do with and turning it loose on mankind. Now, you know, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't have ever been in agreement with an atheist before, but I'm in agreement with this one. <laughs> I and Mr. Hawking see it the same way. They better leave that stuff alone. Now, let's make sense of it for you right now. This is 2015. The church is dead and asleep. The only, the only way you can, the, the only crowds you have in this country today are the crowds that are pumped up by rock and rap, and it's all about love, self love, and positive attitudes, and you know, money and me, myself and I. I'm in love with me, I'm, a, I'm in love with myself, and I'm in love with I. And your wife says, I know you are, and that's why I'm leaving. <laughs> that's the truth. You ought to write a book about 15 ways to love yourself. It'd sell like you wouldn't believe. Absolutely. 
That's all it is. It's a joke. Just a big joke. You know that. It's just a big joke. All right. You've got the people to the point to where they can be moved emotionally, not intellectually, but emotionally. Anything stirs people today. They got crowd mentality. They got mob mentality. Can you imagine something that has created earthquakes, that has made apparitions appear, that you've got scientists warning, don't do this. You don't know what you're going to unleash. Maybe there's a greater purpose in all of that that they're not even aware of. And he's called Satan. Maybe he intends to bring chaos on this earth. Chaos. And you know the old thing? What's the, how's it, how does it go? Ab, uh, what's the term? Order out of chaos. I forget the Latin terminology for it. Order out of chaos. The peacemaker shows up. The earth is in a turmoil and it's blazing and burning. And then the peacemaker shows up. How close could we be to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? How close could we be? How close? The church is asleep, but the Lord's coming back. If I were, if I were, if I were 17, 18, 19 years old this morning, I'd be worried. I've lived 68 years. I'm ready to go meet the Lord. The Lord comes get me. I'm gone. But you young people coming up and you want to start a family, you want to have children, you know, you got all your life in front of you uh, by the grace of God. And to hear about something over here that they can produce one gram of it has the potential of four atomic bombs. Boy, if somebody got a hold of that, you talk about blackmailing a whole nation. And did you know what? They say they're weaponizing it now. And they say now that the nations of the world, although they've joined together over there in Europe with this collider, they've stepped back and thought to themselves, hold on. If this crowd over here gets that, we need that. And there you go. This is what's happening with Iran right now. Barack Obama will allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon, according to the latest 10 years, whatever making difference. But Saudi Arabia has already said, now wait a minute, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, we need a nuclear weapon. Syria says, hold on, we do too. And on Egypt and Jordan and all the rest of those Arab countries, Yemen and all the rest of it, the United Arab Emirates, all of them will want nuclear weapons. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm going to tell you this morning what I really believe. I really do believe this. I believe that all the peace and prosperity and, and, and joy, as far as this world's concerned, that you've enjoyed, enjoy it, because I don't think things are going to get any better. I believe they're going to get worse. And I believe you're just beginning to see the, the beginning of it, and I believe that, uh, uh, I believe you're seeing it. Herman Wook wrote a book. Uh, he was Jew, and he wrote a book entitled The Winds of War. And uh, what that means is that before a war actually breaks out, with physical shooting, it's already broken out in philosophy. It's already broken out in a lot of different ways. Uh, countries are building up their armament and so forth. Well, that's happening right now. It's happening right now. And that war is soon to come. There's going to come an Armageddon. There's coming an ap apocalypse. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready. I hope you are. I hope you're ready to meet the Lord. I hope you're ready. My biggest fear of this place over here is not them blowing up the world. Although, I, you know, the Lord's going to make the decision about that. Right. Here's what I worry about coming out of that place is all this spirit deception, yeah. using it to deceive people. They connect spirituality and science together. Imagine what kind of a union that would have. Science and spirituality. Not Christ, but science and spirituality joined together. Man! They've got what they want when that happens. How many of you know the Lord Jesus this morning? Boy, even so, come Lord Jesus. Now, folks, I've only had three or four days to deal with this. I've gotten some stuff in here that I need to go deeper into and look at a little further because there's some stuff going on here that literally blows my mind. But what I've given out to you this morning is just skimming the surface about what's happening in CERN, Switzerland. Some of you may know a whole lot more about some of this stuff than I do. But if you do, you should be alarmed because of what I've told you the truth. Folks, this is not hypothetical. 
If I understand correctly, no more than a handful of matter was used to blow up Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They released the potential in that and blew it up, if I understand it correctly. And that one gram of antimatter is four times more powerful than what blew up Nagasaki and Hiroshima. You don't want that in the hands of the wrong person. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to use what I've said, Lord, for the glory of God. There may be somebody sitting in this house this morning that's awake now. They've wakened up. And they're alarmed. And they're worried. And they're thinking, my goodness, if half of what that preacher said is true, that's enough to stir me. I'm going to do something about it. In Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, amen.